Welcome. Please. I would like to welcome all those who have joined us today at this webinar on Afghanistan at the crossroads. With respect to this never ending war in that country. Very unusual developments have recently taken place in the wake of the United States troops withdrawal. We have seen hardly any progress in the peace talks in Qatar, but informal talks have moved for peace to other capitals like Moscow and Tehran. It's a strange situation. On the one hand, there is a surge seemingly by all parties to end the strife in Afghanistan. And on the other hand, there is daily escalation in violence. The Taliban claim to hold large parts of the country outside the main cities. And the US has recently started making strikes on their positions. The borders of neighboring countries have been crossed by the Afghan National Army. Its personnel have escaped the fighting and sought refuge in Tajikistan and Pakistan. And above all, there is this genuine fear of what will happen if the Taliban manage to come to power in Kabul. The spillover of the ideology across Afghanistan's borders and a looming refugee crisis. Pakistan is considered the most important player in the Afghan situation today. Apprehensive of the effects of a Taliban government in Kabul, it has been host to 3 million Afghan refugees and is bracing itself for another refugee influx. To discuss these issues and related issues, we have three distinguished speakers. Mr. Anatole, Professor Anatole Levin, Mr. Zahid Hussain, and Dr. Sabah Gulkhatak. The first speaker, is Anatole Levin. He is senior, or will be becoming soon, he will take up that assignment. Senior Research Fellow on Russia and Europe at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft in Washington, DC. Formerly, he was professor at Georgetown University and in the War Studies Department of King's College London. His book, Pakistan, a hard country has been much acclaimed and is on the official reading lists for the United States and British diplomats serving in that country. As a journalist in South Asia many years ago, he had covered the war in Afghanistan. He will speak on the rapidly changing security situation in Afghanistan. And at all, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ms. Umar. I'm delighted to be able, I wish I was in Pakistan again, but anyway, if only by Zoom, I'm delighted to be in contact with Pakistan again. Uh, yes, I mean, as you said, a, a journalist um, with the Mujahideen uh, in the late 1980s, and then on the, um, briefly, uh, on the government side as well, and I've visited Afghanistan intermittently, um, since then, so this now goes back, oh my God, 33, 34 years. And uh, I have to say that uh, for me, both as somebody who's visited Afghanistan during that time uh, and has spent time with, you know, Afghan guerrillas who were in many ways the forerunners of the Taliban um, and also as a student of Afghan history, uh, this, what is happening seems to me uh, to be pretty much uh, in accordance with certain basic patterns uh, of modern Afghan history. Uh, above all, the failure uh, to establish uh, a modern state along 
contemporary international lines, uh, whether by uh, the Afghans themselves or by outside forces with some Afghan help. Uh, now, I, I think, and I, I don't think there's much point in, you know, wrapping this up in you know, euphemisms or camouflage, uh, but it is my sense that the current Afghan state is finished. Um, it may last for longer than some people expect, uh, but um, according to independent analysts, 197 uh, district centers have fallen to the Taliban since May. Um, they don't, much will of course depend on uh, whether the United States continues airstrikes to defend the main cities. Uh, but frankly, I, I don't think that will be enough. Um, and uh, I also think it, that if patterns of Afghan history are anything to go by, the collapse of the state when it comes may come very quickly and unexpectedly. The reason is that, uh, as we saw in 92, um, as we saw during the rise of the Taliban in um, the later 90s, as indeed we saw with the fall of Amanullah way back in 1929, um, uh, Afghan society, uh, uh, as I've often been told, is, is a kind of process of constant conversation and negotiation. And um, when I was traveling in Afghanistan in the late 80s, uh, it was common knowledge the Mujahideen themselves made no secret of it, uh, that there were endless, endless negotiations at local level between themselves and local state garrisons, um, often to do with sharing out the heroin trade, but uh, also basically very often to, to, to just keep things quiet in their own areas. So they go and fight somewhere else, but not where they were. And of course, this um, was tremendously facilitated by local tribal links, familial links, business links, and so forth and so on. Uh, and what that meant was that uh, actually, uh, when the final collapse came in, um, in most of the Pashtun areas, uh, uh, I'm talking now about the rise of the Taliban, um, but more widely in 1992, there was actually very little fighting. Uh, the garrison simply went home indeed with their weapons. Of course, some of their commanders had to flee or die. Uh, and the uh, Taliban, um, in their rise to power, once again, in the Pashtun areas, it was um, rather different elsewhere, of course, uh, respected agreements by which garrisons surrendered on terms. Um, in other words, they didn't break the, the agreement. Uh, they didn't massacre garrisons. Uh, if they were going to do that, they didn't, you know, make the agreement in the first place. And they also, you know, um, designated the commanders on the other side with whom they would not deal and who, who had to leave. Uh, and so, um, and this being Afghanistan and these being Pashtuns, uh, the garrisons, as I say, went home with their weapons, their personal weapons, a very medieval approach, but actually an effective one, you know, when it comes to making sure that uh, transitions are uh, actually, after long years of terrible fighting, the transitions themselves can be, can be very peaceful and rapid. Now, on the other hand, I think we will see, as we've seen before, um, that uh, in certain areas and uh, certain um, ethnic and ethno-religious min uh, minority groups, notably, of course, the Hazar and the Panjshiris, uh, they, of course, will not surrender to the Taliban. Um, uh, they can't, I mean, they cannot join the Taliban, and they will certainly not uh, simply, you know, agree to go home. So, um, the subsequent history of Afghanistan, the history of Afghanistan in years to come, will, I think, be determined by the following questions. The first is, will the Taliban, as the predominant, but not sole, political and armed force in Afghanistan, uh, be willing to negotiate compromises with key ethnic and ethno-religious minorities, uh, guaranteeing them local autonomy and uh, you know, control over their own affairs. Uh, if not, then you know, obviously there is a strong probability of uh, continued and possibly intensified fighting. So that's the first question. The, Second question is, uh, what 
kind of help and what degree of help will outside powers uh, give to uh, ethnic and ethno-religious minorities and anti-Taliban forces. Uh, and uh, this, of course, means the United States, but I think in the long run, it could mean even more importantly, Iran and India. Iran, uh, because it is emotionally, culturally, religiously committed uh, to the Hazara, uh, but also um, to the city of Herat, which of course most Iranians regard basically as an Iranian city, which has somehow, for wrong historical reasons, found itself in Afghanistan. Um, and the Iranians, uh, my information is, are committed to go on defending the Hazaras. The Iranians have established good working relations with the Taliban, but I think you know only up to a point. So that's the first question. The second question is India, uh, which has been the last of all the major powers to come round to the idea that it is necessary uh, to talk to the Taliban. Um, and uh, also, of course, has very, very close links uh, to um, sections of the Afghan state, and in particular, the Afghan intelligence service, the NDS, which is, of course, dominated by Panjshiri Tajiks. Uh, and this raw NDS connection could be of critical importance in determining India's policy. Uh, but the other uh, factor, of course, uh, determining Indian policy will be uh, whether the Taliban will give them assurances. Uh, that may also involve Pakistan quietly giving them assurances uh, of the same kind that the Taliban have now given to America, to Russia, to, chi to China, which is, don't worry, we will not uh, allow bases, we will not allow uh, actions by terrorist groups based in Afghanistan and you and, you know, against the international community in general. Uh, now, of course, the Taliban, I think, uh, are entirely credible when they make that assurance to everyone that promise, and will they be credible in giving that promise to the Indians, and will the Indians believe them if they do? That is a critical question. Uh, thirdly, uh, will... Uh, a, an, an Afghan state dominated by the Taliban continue to receive uh, sufficient and substantial international aid from different countries. Uh, because, as has often been remarked, since the 19, uh, sorry, since the 1880s and British, the way that British subsidies built up Emir Abdurrahman and his state, uh, every Afghan state has been to a greater or lesser degree dependent on subsidies, on aid from outside. Uh, and of course, since 2001, the Afghan state has been overwhelmingly dependent uh, on American and European aid. Um, uh, and without that aid, uh, it will be very difficult uh, to establish you know, any kind of working state. The state will remain extremely weak, and that will you know, increase both um, the likelihood of continued or intensified civil war and dependence on the heroin trade, um, which is, of course, the single biggest bit of the Afghan economy by far. Now, in all this, uh, it seems to me uh, that um, Pakistan's role uh, is crucial uh, in, in terms of the regional approach the approach of regional powers to the Afghan situation and therefore um, to the future of Afghanistan. Uh, and Pakistan, of course, is in the happy position of having good relations now with four out of the five major regional powers, uh, not, of course, with the fifth, which is in the from it. Um, and then, of course, uh, Pakistan uh, has also had good working relations with the Afghan Taliban, not to say anything more strongly than that. Uh, so um, what, in my view, should be the goals of Pakistani policy on, on the basis of these strengths? Um, one uh, should be to use whatever influence Pakistan may have with the Taliban uh, to get them to uh, assure uh, rights and autonomy for certain key ethnic and ethno-religious minorities. Uh, without that, I do not believe that there can be Afghan peace. Um, there could only be a very bloody uh, Af uh, Taliban victory. Um, 
but probably involving continued conflict in certain areas going on forever and certainly you know involving uh, a tremendous amount of bloodshed and the loss of civilian life and of course in consequence uh, major floods of refugees out of Afghanistan uh, principally to Pakistan, as we have seen again and then again in the past, but also towards the West, something which um, everybody has an interest in preventing. Uh, this, by the way, is the, the biggest single fear of Europe when it comes to Afghanistan. It is that Afghan refugees passing across Iran and Turkey will basically replicate what happened in Syria. Um, and uh, as we saw with the Syrian refugee flow, this had a drastically destabilizing effect on European politics in Germany in particular. So this is a great European fear. And this is, um, you know, a, a reason why in principle, uh, European powers would be willing uh, to go on subsidizing Afghanistan in certain ways, in principle. Uh, secondly, um, Pakistan, I think, uh, and obviously, Pakistan has a run to make up election of the international community, uh, must do everything possible to ensure that Afghanistan does not become a base for anti-India and terrorists. And of course, some of these groups have extremely close links to the Afghan Taliban. Uh, because if, um, if India is not convinced uh, of this, then India will support the anti-Taliban uh, opposition, uh, not uh, with Indian troops. I, I think you know, uh, nobody is going to want to send troops into Afghanistan in future. I mean, look, if we haven't learned that lesson from the past 180 years, we've learned nothing at all. Um, but with whatever you know, arms and money, they could. Uh, and that would, of course, keep the help keep a civil war going. Pakistan needs needs to, you know, be able to get the Taliban credibly to give that assurance and to give that assurance itself. Uh, and thirdly, um, Pakistan needs to do everything it can to uh, assure continued international or intensified, in some cases, international aid to uh, Afghanistan, to a Taliban-dominated Afghanistan. Now, that will involve uh, China, very heavily. And of course, China has made by far the biggest paper commitment to economic investment in Afghanistan, though it hasn't, of course, implemented this and can't in the middle of a civil war. Uh, but uh, in my view, um, there is also a, a strong possibility of continued European aid uh, because of the threat of refugees, but also, and this I think is, is a critical point which has not been explored nearly enough because of the need to suppress the Afghan heroin production and heroin trade. And um, heroin uh, is an issue on which, once again, the entire region and Europe, not so much the United States, because it doesn't suffer from it in the same way, can agree on. Um, and uh, in that context, of course, uh, it is vital to remember that the Taliban are the only force in Afghanistan uh, over the past 45 years which has actually managed to suppress the heroin trade uh, in 1999 to 2001, simply because of their authority and prestige in the Pashtun countryside. Um, however, uh, for the Europeans to contribute significant aid to Afghanistan, uh, they would also need certain uh, assurances of um, minimum uh, human rights, respect for human rights, at least in Kabul, because I don't think anyone will notice, frankly, what goes on outside Kabul. Uh, and of course, women rights, women's rights in particular. Uh, the Taliban, frankly, and I mean, uh, pragmatic Taliban people have always recognized this. Uh, unfortunately, America assassinated the, the most pragmatic and intelligent of them, Mullah Mansour. Uh, but the Taliban will need um, modern technocrats, if you will, experts in certain fields, uh, if they are to make any kind of Afghan state work. And the Taliban are in their own particular way heirs of the tradition of Pashtun state building in Afghanistan. They're very conscious of that. But they will need modern experts. And I think part of the challenge 
uh, is to bring them to a recognition, which Mullah Mansour recognized, by the way, long ago, uh, that um, you know, if, they, if they do need these experts, they're going to have to give them a certain room for cultural intellectual freedom, at least in Kabul. Uh, and I think Pakistan can play a very important role in bringing that message home to them, in helping to bring that message home to them, uh, and therefore in continuing Western aid to Afghanistan, without which, as I say, uh, the future of Afghanistan will look even darker than it already does. So anyway, that is my somewhat gloomy view of the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anatole. Uh, my our next speaker is uh, Mr. Zahid Hussain, whom we all know from his uh, columns in Dawn newspaper. He's a journalist of great esteem. He's the author of many books which focus on Afghanistan, No Win War, The Paradox of US-Pakistan Relations in Afghanistan's Shadow. His second book, The Scorpion's Tale, The Relentless Rise of Islamic Militants in Pakistan and Frontline Pakistan, The Struggle with Militant Islam. Zahid has uh, written as a correspondent for many important newspapers and journalists, journals across the world, like the Times of London, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist. And he will speak on the concerns of regional powers in the evolving situation in Afghanistan. Zahid, you've got 20 minutes, so go ahead. Okay, thank you, Dr. Basuma, for inviting me. And uh, uh, so, and it's a very critical time, no doubt about whatever is happening in Pakistan. And uh, the rapid development of situation in, in Afghanistan after the withdrawal of uh, at the drawing down of the, of the American forces uh, has been quite spectacular, but, but not unexpected. I will not say that whatever is happening in Afghanistan at the moment and Taliban gaining grounds in large swaths of uh, Afghanistan, um, it, uh, it may have come as a surprise to many, but I think probably it was uh, in a way building now. Uh, the, uh, one, uh, the, the withdrawal of uh, foreign forces had almost led to collapse of whatever administration in Kabul is. They may have the control of certain areas. They may have this uh, um, army, a professional army. But uh, over the years, uh, the, uh, the authority of the state has, has weakened. And a large part of the country, um, it may not be under control of Taliban. Uh, but basically, there were um, they were contest uh, the authority or the administration was being contested. Um, and uh, uh, I think after uh, the uh, uh, American started negotiating with the Taliban in Doha, uh, way back in, in uh, 19, uh, 1919, uh, 2019, sorry, um, I think uh, there was a clear indication that finally uh, the Americans recognized the Taliban uh, legitimacy as uh, one of uh, the, uh, the main insurgent force in Afghanistan. That gave them um, uh, and I think that kind of legitimacy which Taliban needed. It was the during after after Doha start of Doha talk, Taliban uh, had opened already had opened uh, office in the in Qatari capital, and in fact actually that uh, gave them some kind of uh, forum from where they could uh, interact with other capitals of the world, and they did it quite uh, you know intelligently. So 18 months of negotiation with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the Americans, they showed some kind of, uh, uh, what I guess, shrewdness, and uh, they, they, made this, uh, uh, they, uh, they uh, made it sure that some of their uh, major uh, you know, demand could be accepted. And it was very clear that Americans were in a hurry to leave Afghanistan. And I, um, I don't blame them, 20 years of war or 18 years of war, uh, they, it has made it very clear that there was no military solution 
and and uh, they could not have won this war anyway, in my opinion. But the way they left Afghanistan is quite um, astonishing. Uh, I will uh, when Doha Agreement was signed, it may not be a, a, that kind of uh, a declaration uh, or basically a kind of uh, uh, from uh, the defeat. But uh, obviously, it was not actually the victory of American forces. It was a kind. It was, may not be surrender. But certainly, it was some kind of uh, finally, uh, you know, uh, 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 recognizing that uh, uh, that Taliban uh, they cannot actually win this war. So I think that gives Taliban a huge boost, and in fact, actually, it also had affected, uh, or it has also, you know, affected their uh, their situation in Afghanistan. If you see that, or or, the, or, or when they were negotiating with America. And when they reached that agreement in February 2020 with America, they did not attack American forces, but they continued attacking our, uh, Afghan forces, and uh, because that gave gave them certain kind of a space. A space. So if you could see that America, uh, that the, the escalation of Taliban offensive had started way back actually in uh, uh, the last uh, sorry February 2020. So. In that way, that um, it also gave this impression to the population that our, that Taliban will be winning. So, in a way, actually, uh, when finally Americans decided to leave or withdraw all their forces by September 2021, and uh, uh, so uh, Taliban uh, Taliban uh, may have not only uh, you know consolidated their hold in the their control area, but what was the most spectacular? I think overall, if you see, they had they had actually a strong support with in Pashtun district, particularly in eastern Afghanistan and southern Afghanistan. Uh, but uh, the most, I think, most surprising and most spectacular victory they had was northern Afghanistan, and in some of the area they never had control before, like for example, Badakhshan. Badakhshan actually even during Taliban uh, regime in 1996. They did not have, they could never uh, get, uh, occupy Badakhshan. And similarly, all those provinces uh, which, uh, are, which are situated um, and, uh, uh, along the borders with Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and in fact, actually, a small sport uh, which uh, uh, borders with China. So, what uh, at this, uh, I think more importantly, what they have done is that they control all the borders with, uh, uh, with the regional countries. So that has given them, or even for uh, that border area with uh, Iran. So that has not happened before. So I think probably that has put uh, uh, Taliban into a very commanding position. But saying all that, uh, I think there is a limit to what Taliban can go from here. Uh, it is easier given uh, the situation in Afghanistan, given the, you know, the weakness of the administration, Kabul administration, uh, it was much easier for Taliban to take control of, uh, you know, large swath of um, uh, land uh, in Afghanistan. But a major question is, can they hold it? And uh, uh, and that is the major challenge Taliban will have. And I think probably how I see actually that when we, they say a Taliban controlling more than fifty percent of Afghan land, it does not mean that they have come had they have. Would, they are able to set up their own administration. They have the control because in most of these areas, uh, the Kabul government has almost collapsed. And uh, but uh, the real challenge for one, if you could see, it, that they have not taken over any town, major towns, and the cities, leave aside Kabul. So it may be the part of their strategy, but also that shows the limit limit of their power. So I think probably what we are seeing um, that uh, there will be uh, 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 there will be some kind of uh, uh, not balance of power, but I think they can, uh, they will find some re huge resistance. As Anatol, Professor Anatol has earlier said, that uh, Panjshiris or other Azara will not uh, surrender. To them. So that it means actually that fighting will continue, and uh, that um, and also actually Kabul. Taking over Kabul, as uh, some of some American intelligence agencies had predicted, that it may fall in six months' time, I doubt it very much. 
because um, that will maybe actually the um, Afghan forces in many areas have surrendered or may have fled. But I think probably they still have the strength to defend Kabul. And that, that war will continue. The other thing is that uh, when, uh, when uh, the situation arises, uh, there are other, uh, other factors too. Like, for example, I don't know how far Americans could go, but they have already warned that they will continue bombing uh, the Taliban uh, 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 you know, stronghold. So that, that will get, uh, if they, are, if they come very close to Kabul, I think probably it will have a, uh, have a different connotation. And I think probably regional countries will be, a, uh, will be alarmed by that. So in a way, what I see more likely is continuing civil war. One more factor actually, which, gives, uh, which makes the situation much more dangerous in Afghanistan is the rise of, uh, of the regional militias. Some of the militias had existed like, um, forever, like, for example, um, um, Dostam's militia, Ismail Khan, Sinhrat, and Atta uh, Nur, and Muzar Sharif. They all had uh, their own personal army for a long time. But now we have also seen the emergence of local, regional uh, militias. So that means actually that maybe they may have shown some kind of affiliation with the Kabul government, but they are fighting. For, for their to protect their own fiefdom, so I think probably that that makes uh, the uh, you know possibility of a civil war, a full-fledged civil war. Civil war is already going on, but full-fledged civil war actually is very much there. If the um, if the uh, if uh, the uh, no political settlement is reached, so I think that is going. Uh, that's um, I think that will lead to some kind of fragmentation. Fragment uh, apart, and uh, so no uh, particular group will be able to control the uh, uh, the entire country. Um, what does it mean? It means actually that uh, uh, that uh, it will not have only effect on Afghanistan, but uh, to the surrounding countries and regional countries, because Afghanistan's problem, a conflict in Afghanistan, was several decades mm -hmm. we have seen, particularly last four decades. It has never been only uh, the internal matter. It was basically always been a strong external factor in Afghanistan situation. Uh, two superpower had been involved in war uh, in this country uh, over the last four decades. And uh, we have seen all other regional countries being deeply involved in Afghanistan conflict throughout. Uh, if, if, if you go back to 1980s and later on, uh, the role of, uh, of regional countries has been very, very um, and, uh, significant. Pakistan, as we know, has deeply, have always been deeply involved uh, in this conflict uh, and, uh, from, uh, from 1980s up to uh, you know, 2020 in a different way. And uh, so in a way, actually, if you see that 40 years of war in Afghanistan has direct implications for Pakistan. Whatever happened in Afghanistan during this period had direct bearing on Pakistan. Uh, 19, um, uh, Pakistan had been frontline state way back in 1980s in the war against Soviet uh, Soviet Union, and Pakistan became uh, became frontline state yet again after 2001 invasion of um, of, uh, of Afghanistan. So in a way, actually, it, it may have been fighting war in uh, from different sides. But 2001 war has been very, very peculiar. Pakistan has been actually uh, became that you know ally of United States in what described that war on terror. But uh, uh, there has been a huge actually there was no con such, as such there was no convergence of interest between United States and Pakistan when they enter into new alignment after 9/11. And when we talk about earlier earlier alignment with United States. Even during the Cold War, uh, Pakistan and the United States had some convergence of interest, no doubt about that. And under, in, during in the 1980s, there was also a, a strong convergence of, of interest. And that's why actually that uh, alignment uh, uh, worked very smoothly, in fact. But later on, actually, what we've seen in 2001, uh, it has been described as shotgun battle. Pakistan did not have any option but to join and that was also experiencing that led to led Pakistan to
to uh, to uh, to impress United States yet again. So United States wanted Pakistan. It was actually it was in interest because uh, uh, to fight against Al Qaeda and actually to remove Taliban government, Pakistan's support was necessary. So what uh, we can see actually it was of um, uh, it was an alignment of convenience. And I think probably uh, it was wrongly described as a strategic relationship between the two countries. It was from the very outset a transactional relationship. Pakistan needed United States support to get out of the situation. Pakistan in during the uh, 1990s, Pakistan was the most sanctioned country. Uh, uh, United States, there were several kinds of sanction, US sanction imposed on Pakistan, uh, which means um, nuclear sanction, uh, democracy sanction and, and all that. So two, uh, 2001 actually uh, allowed Pakistan to come back on the world stream. And obviously uh, it opened, uh, uh, it got the, uh, the USA. But from the very beginning, there was huge discrepancy in politics, policy of the two countries. Pakistan did support the uh, United States in fighting Al-Qaeda. But as when it came to Taliban, fighting Taliban, Pakistan's position from the very beginning has been actually uh, uh, that of reservation. Pakistan had insisted from the very outset that uh, only uh, uh, negotiation, direct negotiation with the Taliban could end this war. And I think probably that was a consistent policy that way. And uh, so uh, when it comes to fight uh, Americans battle against Taliban, in fact, Pakistan found itself on the other side. Most of the Taliban leaders had taken refuge in Pakistan. Pakistan became the base of Taliban resistance. There's no doubt about that. And I think probably people who refuse at that point now clearly they admit that uh, that uh, the, the original reorganization came from the bases in Pakistan. So in a way, Pakistan had become a part of the war. You know, all this, um, all the leaders, Bilalullah brother was arrested later on. They lived in Pakistan, uh, Quetta Shura, Peshawar Shura, or for that matter, Miran Shah Shura were in reality, in, uh, in fact, actually, they were real. And this to have been actually throughout this period, Pakistan um, uh, was a part of the war, but not exactly on the side of its ally. So that was actually a kind of relationship which we hardly seen uh, in the history that um, uh, what we describe as free enemy, that we are friends as an enemy. Now actually, uh, now the new situation arises. In a way, actually, uh, uh, as I was um, in a, in a, uh, uh, at a conference and some American uh, former uh, officials, senior officials, they said that it was Americans who, who changed their position on Taliban because um, they actually, when they started negotiating, they basically accepted the fact that there was no other way out. So what I'm coming to is that the war has all has already been inside Pakistan. It's not like that uh, after, uh, uh, you know, the situation, the new evolving situation that Pakistan war will uh, have come into Pakistan. It had been there for, for the last 20 years. So I think probably now the situation is much more dangerous, much more because um, it is not 1990 situation. It is not a situation when Pakistan fully supported the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. At that point, actually, uh, you know, uh, civil war in Afghanistan because of, uh, uh, of uh, other factors, um, uh, it did not affect Pakistan that much. But now actually, when we are talking about 2021, it's a different situation. It's a situation because uh, during this 20 years, we have also seen Pakistan fighting its own war against militancy. TTP, uh, uh, there, there, there is specific uh, Pakistani with uh, uh, this Taliban uh, Pakistan with this specific Pakistani agenda had been there, and uh, for la for from 2007 and to 2008 recently, Pakistan has been fighting the TTP. And in fact, actually, that is the biggest dilemma for Pakistan, because on the on one hand, Tehrike Taliban Pakistan, they may have a Pakistani specific agenda. They may have uh, a very different objective than uh, with uh, uh, than the Afghan Taliban, because the Afghan Taliban were actually focused on the you know fighting a uh, uh, fighting American forces. 
while TTP was actually wanted to impose its own uh, brand of Islam through uh, through through the through force. So basically, but the, the worldview is the same, and I think probably that was the dilemma Pakistan faced from the area that one on one re, uh, one on the one side it was supporting the Taliban tacitly, if not directly, for different reasons, as Anatol has earlier um, you know mentioned. That was India factor. I think probably when we see a, a Afghanistan situation over the years, and particularly now, is that it's all that uh, Afghanistan have also be, uh, had been a, uh, a center of proxy war. And in fact, over the last 20 years, if you see Pakistan policy was driven by the fact how to uh, curtail, uh, how to contain Indian influence in, a, in Afghanistan. And that has also led to Pakistan's support for Taliban, apart from other reasons. They may not be very happy with it. There was some kind of apprehension also that in the long term, Afghan, uh, Taliban control over Afghanistan will not be uh, you know, uh, favorable to Pakistan because it will need the Taliban control, even in the, not in the, I'm not talking about total control, even control in the part of, the, of Afghanistan will give a huge boost to Pakistani Taliban and Pakistani militant group. So these are the apprehension on one side. Pakistan support uh, uh, has been very critical in bringing the Taliban back on the, on the table. But on the other side, this is also uh, facing this uh, you know, predicament now, policy predicament. And now last point, actually, I've already taken down time. Uh, last time, I said other, that basically other regional power, like, for example, Iran. Iran has um, has an interest, as has been described by um, uh, Natal earlier, has a huge interest in, in a, it's a security issue, and they have been very actually, uh, you know, have, have have carried out very careful policy. They never had good relations with Taliban. They had actually, in fact, actually in 1990s, they came close to war with with Afghanistan, but lately they had developed relationship with uh, with the Taliban group. Many Taliban leaders. Have, are living in a, with their family living in, in Iran. So, in fact, actually, that brings uh, uh, Iran uh, has has been supporting uh, or tactical giving a tactical support to Taliban because of certain reasons. Number one, they want actually Taliban to fight Daesh. Number two, they also accept that Taliban is not reality and they will be part of the whatever uh, you know a power structure comes in uh, later. Uh, 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 after uh, uh, you know, after the withdrawal of American forces. Number three, recently Taliban uh, uh, Iran held several meetings with Taliban leaders in Tehran, and the purpose was to get to get an understanding with them that they will not actually attack Hazara or other man and safeguard Iran. And I think on the other side, uh, so they are very clear about their position. They would not like Islamic Emirates to take over or restore. And the same thing about other regional countries. They, they, there's, there's almost a convergence of interest, uh, like for example, China, uh, Pakistan, uh, Iran, and Russia. There's generally, they, 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 they accept or recognize Taliban as a force. But none of these countries would like the restoration of Islamic Emirates in the form. So that is also going to be the limit on Taliban's offensive or Taliban, uh, uh, Taliban's, uh, you know, effort or, or strive to take over control of entire Afghanistan. So in a way, actually, I see the role of regional countries becoming very, very important, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, that is the only way. I see because Americans, I, uh, they may still have some role there, but I think probably it's the regional countries who have much larger stake in the peace of, in Afghanistan. So probably that is the only way out. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Dai. Thank you very much for this really excellent analysis of Pakistan's relationship with the Taliban beginning from the beginning. And now this is, uh, it is my very great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Sabah Gulkata to take the floor. Sabah is a former member of the Planning Commission of Pakistan, and uh, she was the executive director of the Sustainable Development Policy Institute 
for many, many years. In fact, she made it from where she is. She specializes in comparative politics and her research interests revolve around political economy of development, feminist and political theory, gender issues, public policy, governance, militarization, refugee women and refugee politics, the whole gamut. And Sabah is going to speak today on apprehensions about a Taliban government in Afghanistan. I suppose she speak with special reference to what is likely to happen to women under a Taliban government. Sabah, the floor is yours. 20 minutes. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, just this morning there was a press conference in Kabul uh, by Afghan women leaders and uh, political and civil society activists where they have actually outlined their fears uh, um, about the current situation and what needs to happen. And, I'm happy to share that with you, but it should be out there on Twitter and everywhere as well. Um, I wanted to start off with saying that there are no winners in any conflict and the fears of a Taliban government, but also the fears of the current situation of uncertainty, um, you know, it's not something new, but at the same time, we do need to remember history. Uh, when I talk about women, I sort of now roll my eyes because I keep wondering who will even want to listen to <laughs> the same stuff we've been hearing for the last maybe 20, 25 years. But um, I also realize that many, uh, there are many uh, new, uh, you know, younger people who've not been around that long and who don't remember. So 40 years ago, when, when the conflict started, um, I'll start with how women are integral uh, to any kind of conflict situation. They're not sort of only in the humanitarian realm, although that is where uh, they are placed uh, generally. Um, when I begin with that history, the first thing that comes to my mind are the camps, the refugee camps in Pakistan, and how women were integral to the jihad in Afghanistan because with the nine different Mujahideen parties at that time, uh, the, the level of aid, what kind of aid will go to which party de uh, depended upon their following and how did following take place in the camps in Pakistan, but by uh, ensuring that refugees were given refugee status and access to camps for their families uh, by signing a declaration of which uh, Mujahideen leader they would be uh, following or supporting. They, they did an allegiance to one of those parties. This was not something that was very well known at the time, but it was very much part of uh, giving refugee status. Um, people who were not willing to give support to any of them were denied uh, access to the camps. <coughs> Furthermore, the camps were used, uh, and this is how the Mujahideen were produced. Uh, the camps were used for training the Mujahideen, we all know that. Um, and uh, they would go back they could go back and fight the jihad because they knew that their women will not be interacting with anyone else because we remember from the 80s and 90s the different fatwas that would come out about women who should not leave the camps, women should not be leaving, in fact, the little homes that were built inside of the camps. <coughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that the Afghan Jihad was predicated on the isolation of women. Men could go back and fight in Afghanistan um, comfortable in the knowledge that their women were not interacting with anyone else. Um, so, so what I'm trying to say is that these conflicts uh, that rage on and on and on 
also make use of women. And it's not like women were just sitting safely. They, they, they were uh, given a specific role very, very consciously. And only under those circumstances were the fighters willing to go back and fight. If they knew they were women were interacting with other men, they wouldn't have been that comfortable. So more and more under the, the, the whole garb of Islam and culture and so on, these things were further um, you know, strengthened. And also in the camps, what was strengthened was when it came to women's rights, um, you know, in the camps, we applied Pakistani law, we applied Sharia law, we applied Afghan law. But when it came to women, marriage, whatever, the most retrogressive interpretation of whichever law was applicable was applied. So um, I'm, I'm just talking about the history and, and want to come back to, to what is today. These fears still haunt, but that is not the only history that we have. On our side of the Durand line, women were deeply affected by what happened. Not only did Ziaul Haq get his lease on life and militarization continued, but the whole Islamization process was possible because he was able to convince the international community that Pakistan would be an important stakeholder, Islamization was put in, and lo and behold, we, we, we got the Hudud laws that technically, legally made women unequal citizens. Um, so, so it is not like the fallout was not on this side of the border. It was there and it continues to be there today, whether it was the, uh, you know, arms and militarization of our campuses at that time, uh, how syllabus was controlled, who would call the shots, literally and metaphorically, all of that uh, continues to be there today, the debates over syllabus, what is appropriate, what is not, all of that continues till today. So it is not something that has gone and is past. Uh, it is something that that lives with us and has become a part of us. To this day, what Zayal Haq imposed is, uh, which was to for women to cover their heads, uh, women in parliament, you would think are empowered, but they all cover their heads, because that has become sort of uh, something that is very acceptable. And I'm not talking of post 9-11 uh, identity politics. I'm talking of a very different politics through which this has uh, become possible. Um, and we can discuss this. Um, coming back to the present, so we kept, we keep thinking 1994 or 1996 might be come back all over again when the Taliban took over. But that is not going to happen this time. At least that's my analysis. Despite a very, very pessimistic situation and outlook, I feel this time uh, people are going to resist for many, many different reasons. Those who have witnessed refugeehood in the past uh, do not want the same to take place this time. There will be fights. There will be resistance. Women are more vocal. They have more voice today than they had 30 years ago or 40 years ago or even 20 years ago. Um, so, so, so I think that is something different. Civil society has sort of some level of presence in Afghanistan. And uh, even though it is urban centers, there are people, there are ideas that speak out and that are speaking out as indicated by the press conference today or the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission. And uh, complete exclusion of women will not be possible. However, what cost, cost that is what, like I said, we still live with our past. The past is the present. And so what is it that will be the cost for women on both sides of the Buren line? Uh, both sides, the Taliban are resurgent in what was formerly the uh, our federally administered tribal areas. You find many rallies taking place. They may not get press coverage against what is happening today. 
the, the resurgent Taliban uh, who are making their own committees, making their own uh, fasnas, uh, as in decisions, uh, using whatever interpretation of Sharia that they wish to apply. Um, all of this is taking place uh, on both sides uh, and fundamental rights are being denied to women on both sides of the Durand line. I'm not saying it's uh, across Pakistan. What I'm saying is it is happening in the southern districts, former Fata of Khyber Pukhtunkhwa province. Uh, restrictions on, uh, you know, pamphlets saying restrict, uh, talking about restrictions on uh, of, uh, on women's mobility, restrictions on uh, their right to work. Uh, they are all being discouraged. The right to education, once again, and we have seen this happen in SWAT. So it's not so far back that we can't remember what the Taliban can do. Um, and the kind of uh, terror with which they can, uh, you know, uh, enforce what they think is um, is right. The killing of musicians, which happened in Kandahar two days back, is reminiscent of what happened before. Also, so so the point is. Today also, women are targets, uh, human rights defenders have become targets, academics have become targets, health workers are targets, media um, and journalists in Afghanistan, women have been targeted, um, civil servants, police, the army, um, everyone is, is, has been targeted and therefore, uh, and this is similar to what happened in SWAT. If we want to see a, a, a small sort of a model of what can happen in Pakistan, all we need to do is go back and look at what happened in SWAT. Um, in, in, in the present context, somehow in Pakistan, I find that there are not very many uh, voices raising the human rights costs of this conflict on our side of the border, except perhaps uh, PTM might be, and, and that's not your <laughs> normal <laughs> whatever CSO. Um, but even PTM has a very, very ambivalent relationship when it comes to women and, you know, uh, how, how to raise the women's question. So, so even there you find that even in part, former FATA, women's voices are barely given any space and barely heard. And therefore, for, for many of us, this should be a situation of extreme concern because we, we, we still have what happened in the uh, 80s thanks to Ziaul Haq. We still suffer all of that and we don't want to suffer more. In Afghanistan, it is the same and there are many people who are exiting. Uh, you hear the same stories of refuge, what one heard of refugees in the 90s or 80s that they're leaving with only whatever they can gather. They are selling their properties uh, at whatever price they can get and getting out within like two days of making a decision. Pakistan, uh, UNHCR has said that we will probably have about 800,000 refugees coming in, except that this time we will not call them refugees. That is not UNHCR, that is the Pakistan government saying this time they are externally displaced Afghans. Now, what this implies legally for refugees is a matter of concern. On the other hand, our border has been fenced and is continuously being fenced. Um, we do not know how the refugees will be treated. We do not know what the fallout of the refugees will be and what life will be for them uh, on both sides. That is a concern. Um, there are many other concerns, like I said, about fundamental rights. But I want to stop on one, you know, one question, which is about the role of the state. We keep demanding, you 
question that I'm frankly speaking, what I'm trying to grapple with is what does one do when the state in the modern sense of the term no longer exists? A, a state is supposed to be made up of, you know, territory uh, well-defined, yes, that's there, of a population that's well-defined, yes, that's there. But what about a government and what about sovereignty? A government that is unable to enforce its writ across Afghanistan uh, or you know, have any kind of sovereignty in a meaningful way, what kind of state is this? And Afghanistan is not the only state how, uh, that, that suffers like this. There are many others, whether that's Syria or Iraq or other, Libya or, you know, wherever US forces have intervened. Um, how does the international community intend to deal with such so-called states is the issue that I want to raise because all the other rights that come out of a, a constitution and a state that is held together um, come as a result of a modern state system that is working. But here we see that it is not really working. So, so how do you contend with that? How does one even apply any kind of international conventions, laws, uh, you know, to, to a territory where we do not know what they will sort of support and the idea that only Kabul, if Kabul can be sort of uh, kept as, you know, some kind of a showpiece, and if Kabul can display that it is all is well and the Taliban can accept a few rights. Well, what about the rest of the country? Uh, how does one deal with that? Uh, I'll leave it on this note and this question that I keep thinking about. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sabah. Yes, you touched a chord in my heart when you talked about what happened in Swat. And we all remember what the women and minorities in Swat had to suffer when the Taliban ruled that valley. We will now have a short uh, question and answer session. There are so many questions that I really don't know where to start. But I will start with the series of questions posed by Mr. Tamizul Haq, who is a very senior member of our institute. Uh, Tamiz Saab, I can't address all your four questions, but I will pose this next question to Anatole. Assuming that the Taliban take control of Afghanistan, do you think they will be as friendly to Pakistan as they were before 9-11, taking into consideration Pakistan's support to the United States for 20 years? No, I don't think that they will be as friendly, uh, both precisely because of what Pakistan did then, uh, but also because I think this time around uh, the Taliban will have more options. Um, in the late 1990s, they were extremely isolated internationally. Russia was against them. China was absent. Iran was strongly against them. India was strongly against them. And the United States was absent. Now, this time, um, most of the regional powers have established some kind of working relationship with the Taliban already. Um, and so uh, the Taliban won't need Pakistan so much. Uh, on the other hand, you know, as has always been the case, uh, Pakistan will control Afghanistan's main road to the sea. Uh, for Afghan exports um, and imports. Uh, Iran will play a role, uh, but then of course um, the, the, the Taliban will have to uh, ensure the you know, good relations with Iran as well, which raises another set of issues. Um, so that uh, my sense is that uh, although relations will not be so close, uh, I do not think that the Taliban will become enemies of Pakistan uh, in the sense of uh, trying to restart the civil war in Pakistan uh, and launch some new jih uh, jihad, you know, to once again try to abolish the Durand line and take the Pashtun areas of, of Pakistan. And of course, an additional reason for that is that there is a force in Afghanistan which um, 
none of us have mentioned yet, but which has, of course, been responsible for some of the worst atrocities in that country uh, in recent years, which is ISIS or, or Daesh. Uh, they are, of course, bitter enemies uh, of the Taliban, and they have incorporated a large part uh, of the Pakistani Taliban who fled across the border into Afghanistan. Uh, as long as they remain some kind of threat to the Taliban, um, you know, that will also, in a way, lead to an automatic alignment between uh, the Taliban and Pakistan. So, um, you know, a, a, a Taliban dominated Af Afghanistan will not be a, a, a Pakistani client state, as so many people have, have alleged. Uh, it never was, actually, you know, as, as, as we know. I mean, the, the Afghans have a remarkable ability to turn around and kick in the teeth people who have um, who have helped them uh, but I don't think that it will be an enemy another question from Mr Tamizul Haq and uh, perhaps Zahid you'd like to answer it is with respect to India's uh, friendship future friendship with the Taliban and do you think it will be harmful for Pakistan I don't think there will be a friendship between India and Taliban. Uh, obviously, Taliban um, have um, uh, now a reality, and I think probably there is a debate going on uh, among the policymakers in Delhi that uh, they should actually establish some kind of contact with Taliban. And some of, I think, probably according to uh, uh, to some report, media reports, uh, Indian foreign minister had met the Taliban leader uh, in in Doha. So they may have some contacts, but certainly India has a huge reservation about um, uh, about Taliban. Uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, they may try to, if if Taliban ever take over, that's a, that's not a possibility yet. But uh, even if the, if Taliban take over uh, Afghanistan, India may try to establish some kind of contact, but it does not mean that they will have a friendly relationship, um, or even the the the. the interests do not converge at all. So uh, I don't think that India will have that kind of relationship they, uh, even if they want. There are a number of questions from Mr. Kaiser Bengali. But we will, uh, Kaiser, if you don't mind, we just address two of them. The first question is, the Taliban assures its neighbors of non-interference. But Pakistan has internal Taliban ideologues. How will Pakistan protect itself from this fifth column? Anatole, would you take that question? Mm -hmm. uh well, as I say, the, the the really close links between Pakistani militants and Afghans now are, are with Daesh, not with the Afghan Taliban. Um, I mean, obviously, an Afghan Taliban victory in Afghanistan would, in some ways, you know, uh, strengthen morally and you know, in terms of ideological confidence, uh, Islamist forces within Pakistan, uh, but. Um, you know, th these suffer from their own, uh, well, ha both have their own real strengths in terms of support within Pakistan, uh, but also, of course, uh, as we have repeatedly seen over the years, um, suffer from, you know, very grave limitations and weaknesses, thank God, uh, and have never, you know, been able to get anywhere remotely close to achieving, you know, electoral majorities or or you know, majority popular support. Uh, and of course, when they have revolted by force of arms, um, they have been eventually, though after considerable, of course, wobble and tremendous suffering, uh, they have been defeated by the Pakistan army. So I, uh, I, I don't think that a, an, a, a Taliban success in Afghanistan would automatically lead to new destabilization of Pakistan. Uh, except, of course, in terms of, of refugees and ongoing civil war, that would obviously have a major impact. Another question from Kaiser. Uh, how will the US monitor Afghanistan after pulling out its forces from Afghanistan? Zayed, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I think um, probably there's a lot, talk, a lot of talk going on. And um, in, um, there is a, some indication that United States will uh, will like to have some kind of you know monitoring 
system in place uh, in some neighboring countries at, uh, uh, for the counter uh, terrorism um, effort. And I, I think that uh, is still not uh, clear because Americans, um, after withdrawal of the troops, hardly have not much interest left in this. They may have certain that they would not like the country of Afghanistan to become the center of uh, those terrorist, global terrorist organizations. And I think probably that uh, was the key uh, clause in Doha agreement between United States and, and, uh, uh, and Taliban. So I think um, uh, that, that's one of the reasons why the Americans uh, finally agreed to pull out from the, uh, from the uh, uh, pull out their troops from there. I think uh, they, in the present uh, uh, you know, world, they don't need that, those kind of bases. America already maintaining about 22 bases in the Middle East and in this region. And I don't think they need another uh, base of the military operation. They certainly would like to have some kind of counter uh, terrorism cooperation with Pakistan. And what shape it will be, uh, nobody exactly knows. But uh, it's a doubtful, uh, I, don't, I, I don't actually um, uh, think that they would like to have base in Pakistan. I don't think they would, uh, they would like to have one, uh, but they certainly would like to have some kind of counter-terrorism uh, cooperation. What shape does it take? Not clear. Uh, Zahid, there's another question that directly directed towards you from uh, Sayyid Hassan Habib Sahib. He says, you talked about Iran's relations with the Taliban. Do you think there is a future in these relations, given the Taliban's hatred of the Hazaras? I think uh, the uh, Taliban have developed this tactical relationship with, with Iran, uh, with the Taliban. Um, and I think probably there were uh, various reasons for what, for, for their, uh, for their uh, you know, softening of attitude towards Taliban. First, it was uh, when the American forces were still there. So in a way, actually, the uh, Iran Iranians want to actually have some kind of counterbalancing uh, to just to protect their interests. And that was the period when, uh, I mean, quite senior Taliban leaders have taken uh, shelter there. And one other, uh, like the Yabaga, former spokesman of, um, uh, of Taliban, uh, and who basically uh, is now in the, not in the good books of Taliban leadership at the point, but even Mullah Mansur, Akhtar Mansur, the, uh, who, who, was, who succeeded Mullah Omar as the head, his family lived in Afghans in, in Iran. And uh, if you remember, he was killed um, when he was coming back um, uh, from Iran. So, uh, all, but they basically, it does not mean that, they, uh, uh, that Iranians would like the restoration of, uh, of uh, old style Emirates or control, uh, basically a full control of Taliban. I think the latest meeting in, in Tehran, one of the purpose of was this, that the, the, you know, the participant of that meeting, apart from Taliban leadership, Kanuni was there from old Panchiri uh, group, uh, Northern Alliance. There were several other members of Northern Alliance and some Hararas also. So what I actually know about this, that uh, one thing Iranians were interested that Taliban should, uh, in, uh, uh, should in, uh, assure the safety of Hazaras. And I think probably that they would like to. And Taliban are also very shrewd. In fact, actually, if you see over the years, they have tried to, to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, develop an image that they're inclusive group. And in fact, actually, uh, they're one third of the members, top membership council, uh, uh, Shura council, uh, comprises um, non Pashtuns. They are Tajiks, they are. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, last year they appointed a Hazara Shia uh, in their local, uh, you know, uh, 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 local, uh, uh, sorry, in, uh, a local council. I think probably that they are trying to give an impression that they are, they represented uh, the entire, entire Afghanistan. I think probably that Iranians would like them to, uh, to have some kind of, uh, you know, security, uh, to provide security to Hazaras. Whether it works or not, that's a total different thing. Uh, Sabha, uh, would you like to answer the next question? In the post-US withdrawal scenario, what will be Pakistan's take? What do you think will be Pakistan's take? 
on human rights issues in Afghanistan? I, I don't know if our foreign minister considers the Taliban to be intelligent and good people. Then I really um, can't predict what our take will be from what it seems uh, our strategic depth policy has not really changed. Um, uh, what I would want to know, uh, you know, is what would be the take even for us on our side of the border. Um, in the past, a lot was just naturalized under the garb of culture and religion. Uh, and frankly speaking, just a short comment, when Saudi Arabia removed the requirement of mehram for Hajj that we all grew up believing is an Islamic, you know, strict Islamic thing that you, a woman can't go for Hajj without a man, a mehram. Uh, when that, I was just, uh, you know, surprised that we all believed it without ever questioning it. So, so this whole thing of religion and culture becomes very, very uh, questionable. Um, and so, yes, uh, I think uh, we need to push our government uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, the human rights situation um, in both Afghanistan and Pakistan is respected somehow, but whether that will happen or not is very, very up in the air. Tanvir Khalid, who is the secretary of this institute, has a question for Anador. Do you think the Taliban will have learned lessons from the earlier stint in power in Afghanistan? Repression and forceful application of Islamic laws leading to isolation from the international community? Well, I certainly hope so. Um, I was much more confident of that, I have to say, when, you know, when Mullah Mansour was the, uh, was the leader. Um, obviously, you know, the present leadership has a very hard line tradition behind them. Uh, of course, it, the, the real question here is Kabul and some other centers. Uh, frankly, in the Afghan countryside, the Taliban did not change very much, um, you know, certainly not in the Pashtun countryside. Uh, and in those areas of the countryside, um, you know, under some form of government control over the past 20 years, they have remained very, very conservative. Uh, I believe once again that the key issue here will be uh, the degree of pragmatism um, among the, the Taliban leadership, uh, the degree of their awareness of two things. Um, the first is the need for international aid. And the second thing is how an, an awareness of the fact that that international aid, uh, certainly from the West, uh, will depend on uh, certain, you know, sufficient respect for uh, women's rights in particular, and certain freedoms. Uh, but secondly, of course, as, as I said in my original remarks, um, whether the Taliban leadership will recognize that um, in order to, to, to build up any kind of Afghan state, which I think they do want to do, uh, they will require um, the kind of modern educated people uh, who, and to, to keep those, to keep them from simply fleeing abroad, uh, as they did in the 1990s, they will need to accord them uh, a sufficient space of freedom. Um, that is my hope. Uh, but, um, you know, in the end, how much do we really know of what goes on, you know, within the heads of the, of the Taliban leadership? Here's a uh, question from one Ms. Adil Yaqub to all the panelists about the level of support given by the Pakistan military establishment to the Afghan Taliban at the moment. And how do you think it will transition in the coming months, especially in the context of the dangerous rhetoric 
coming out of government officials on the Afghan, I suppose, in the Afghan nation. Zahid, would you like to take that question? I think, uh, mm, uh, Look, actually, there's the fact that uh, uh, Taliban got sanctuary here, and they uh, basically all reorganized themselves. That's a not um, a not no more a secret. Uh, but uh, uh, what kind of support or uh, the military is giving now? I I doubt it very much that at the moment uh, there will be a direct military support for the Taliban from Pakistan uh, because the, that's a very delicate issue, uh, situation. And I think, um, uh, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, because uh, still Pakistan want uh, to uh, want Taliban to become the part of the mainstream and the power structure. But uh, I am I'm, I'm bit uh, uh, you know I'm not very sure that they would like uh, but the restoration of uh, Islamic Emirates, the old style Taliban rule in Afghanistan, because the um, uh, uh, what I heard uh, from them is that uh, it will have this far, uh, far-reaching consequence for Pakistan. They, 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 the main concern is that uh, the war should come to an end, and I don't think Pakistan ha can afford this adventure of directly supporting uh, militarily the Taliban. I think uh, I don't think that uh, will happen. Their their the support may, is there. Uh, to form, uh, to be, become a part of the government. There are a series of questions. There's a question from uh, Hamna Kamal. She is one of our researchers. And the question is to Anatole. With uh, Imran Khan's utter refusal to give bases to America, will Pakistan and the United States have a different kind of alliance related to Afghanistan? If yes, what kind of alliance could that be? I, I don't believe that the United States and Pakistan will have an alliance uh, related to, to, to Afghanistan or indeed anywhere else in future. And I think China's close links to Pakistan also make alliances such impossible. Uh, however, um, pa th this has not been, I think, fully recognized, but um, you know, over the past 20 years, uh, Pakistan has worked pretty consistently on the whole uh, to, to help prevent um, international terrorist attacks against America and the West. Uh, for the, you know, quote, quote differently from in you know, other things, um, for the simple reason that such terrorist attacks don't help Pakistan in any way, and obviously really themselves threaten Pakistan through American retaliation. I think that will continue um, in the sense that Pakistan will uh, assure the US and will you know, use its influence with the Taliban to help make sure that, uh, that Afghanistan does not once again become a base for terrorism against the United States or Europe, uh, or of course China, because the, um, uh, but I, I believe that the, the Taliban themselves will recognize that because after all, you know, everyone with any sense, even the hardest line Taliban leader, uh, just as the most diehard Pakistan general, recognizes that 9-11 was a disaster for them that, you know, brought um, uh, obviously catastrophe for the Taliban government of Afghanistan, but also brought colossal suffering and losses uh, to Pakistan. So I think that kind of cooperation between Pakistan and the USA will continue, but I think it will be a fairly narrowly focused one. Question from Sayyid Moaz Shah, who's a member of this institute. He says, Ashraf Ghani himself stated yesterday, that on, the only solution can be a dialogue, and there can be no military solution. Do you think the Taliban really want to negotiate with the existing government, or would they rather want an unconditional negotiation, or to re-establish re the Islamic Emirate instead of the Islamic Republic that exists? And at all, do you think they want the Emirate 
yes, I, I think that that ev every Taliban in his heart, in some cases perhaps her heart among their supporters, uh, wants a restoration of the emirate. Um, and I do not think that they will negotiate with the existing government um, in its existing form. They've said they won't again and again, and you know, given what's happening now, why should they? Uh, however, um, I think the, the question is whether they will be willing to negotiate with certain parts of the existing Afghan state and its supporters, uh, and um, you know, will will negotiate compromises with them, uh, just as the Mujahideen before them uh, were willing to uh, not to negotiate with Najibullah, but of course to make deals with certain parts. Uh, of the Afghan communist state. Um, that I think is the, is the question for the future. And uh, of course, uh, the Islamic Emirate does not have to be the same as the Islamic Emirate or not exactly the same as it existed before 2001. So the question I think once again is uh, the degree of uh, pragmatism uh, of, of the, the, the Taliban leadership, but I, I I, I do not think that pragmatism will lead them to, to seek some kind of compromise with the Afghan, with the present Afghan government. Uh, Ahmed Rifat wants to know, after the withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan, to what extent will China fill the vacuum? Zahid? Well, I think um, uh, it's not filling the vacuum. China um, has uh, no... Uh, uh, has a has a role in this, and I think probably over the last few months, particularly, we have seen China uh, uh, asserting itself more. But uh, I do, it's, uh, it's, it is not like actually f uh, filling the role because China's um, ambition does not have that kind of ambition to have uh, uh, you know some kind of political uh, control or hold over Afghanistan. They would not like. Um, so far, actually, the uh, Chinese policy has been uh, very pragmatic. Um, they have very good relations with the uh, Taliban. In fact, actually, if, uh, day before yesterday, Chinese uh, uh, Mullah brother, uh, who is the head of, uh, of uh, uh, Doha office, met with Chinese leaders. And I think probably uh, and, uh, China has also had a, a, a reasonably good relations with the, with the Afghan government. But I think what China wants to play its role uh, of a more kind of, you know, facilitator for some kind of political uh, 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 arrangement uh, that could lead to a, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, inclusive government in Afghanistan. And that they have made it very clear. But I don't think China would like to get more deeply involved in a one affair. There are many other questions, but I'm asked to wind up now because we've Actually, we've run out of time. And I want to thank all those who participated in this webinar. And my very special thanks to all the three speakers. From Anatole, we got some kind of vision about the future in Afghanistan. Should the Taliban come to power? especially what kind of relationship they would forge with the minorities and the ethnicities, to what extent they could give some kind of autonomy to them to live. And Zahid spoke so well on, and I was especially impressed by the way he dealt with Pakistan's long-standing relationship with the Taliban over many decades. And there was, uh, and I'll take away this hope which Sabah has expressed that next time round, should the Taliban come to power, they will not be able to impose the kinds of restrictions which they did when they were in power last time in Afghanistan on the women of that country or even on minorities. Because the women have come 
a long way since then. Uh, they, at least around Kabul, they have been mainstreamed in the in life and in governance. Uh, women have a very big representation in parliament in, in, in Afghanistan. And she predicts, I hopefully rightly, that there will be resistance to any such imposition. But there are disconcerting reports that wherever the Taliban holds sway today, they have started imposing the same kinds of restrictions. So I don't think we should be so complacent about it. However, this was a delightful session. And I thank you, Anatol and Zahid and Sabah for making it so very useful for everybody. Next time, when a Taliban government or a non-Taliban government takes over in, in Kabul, I hope we can have another session. Goodbye and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks a lot and let us keep thank in touch. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anatol. Thank you. And Sabah, thank you very much. Thanks.